me get this shared here. All right. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a Shiny app that um, I developed in collaboration with the Infectious Disease Dynamics Group at Hopkins. And this was uh, intended to help evaluate the impact of COVID-19 test trace isolate programs. Um, so if you'd like to access these slides, uh, I'll post them after this talk at lucymcgowan.com slash talk. Uh, See so if you can find them there. They should be there in just a couple minutes after I finish uh, giving this talk. So I wanted to just start by uh, acknowledging my collaborators on this project. Um, Emily Gurley, Justin Lessler, Elizabeth Lee, and Kira Grants did a lot to sort of build both the methods that I'm going to be talking about today and also influence how this particular application uh, was, was developed. They, at the time, were all uh, at Hopkins, um, although a couple of them have since gone elsewhere. And so this is sort of the outline uh, of how, what I'm going to talk about today. I'll start by describing the model that we used. And so um, this group uh, came up with a, a novel way to model this particular, um, th this phenomenon, this test trace isolate, um, kind of how people move through these compartments and how you can use uh, information that you might have about a certain community to try to estimate the effective reproductive number. I'll talk about what that means in a second um, using this, using that these um, these epidemiological tools, uh, and then I'll very briefly talk about an R package that we developed that implements this model, um, and then I'll spend the bulk of the time focusing on the Shiny application and sort of a couple small details on some different tools that we used within Shiny to make this application work. And then I, I don't think I'm actually going to have a time to demo it myself, but I'll show you the link. Uh, and if you'd like to sort of demo the application, you can do that as well. And I also have a link to the GitHub repository. So if you're interested in creating an application like this, all of the code is open and you can do so. So the goal of this work, um, basically these test trace isolate programs, these are an essential part of uh, infectious disease control in general. And they essentially offer this targeted approach, um, as a more targeted approach than many non-pharmaceutical interventions. But an effective use of these programs basically require uh, the folks who are implementing them to be able to estimate their impact. And so um, that's what this, the tools that we uh, developed were intended for. So these were essentially attended, intended for public health uh, departments, um, to be able to, or, or any institution who might be implementing uh, some kind of contact tracing or test trace isolate program to be able to see how their program is impacting the community transmission, as well as be able to evaluate whether they like, kind of to optimize for certain changes they might want to make to their program um, to figure out how that could kind of optimally impact transmission. So a little bit about the model behind the scenes. Um, this actually, I, I'm realizing I, the picture I have here is to the Med Archive, but this has since been published in PLOS, and so you can find in PLOS Medicine. Um, it's the same title, Maximizing and Evaluating the Impact of Test Trace Isolate Programs. Um, you can find the actual mathematical details there. So this is a little bit about the mathematical framework. I've sort of simplified it for this particular talk, but I thought it would be somewhat helpful, especially because most of the folks in the audience are quantitative. And so you're likely interested a little bit in kind of the gears behind what this is actually implementing. So the reproductive number, I think a lot of us are familiar with this term now, uh, just based on, you know, how... Um, based on all the news and things that uh, around COVID-19. But in case you're not, this is the average number of onward transmissions an infected, in, infected individual is expected to make. So here I've got this little person who's sick and they infect two people. So in this case, um, you know, uh, the, the reproductive number would be two. And so for our uh, model, we've basically designed these compartments uh, that, that infected individuals could fall into. Um, they could either be detected, so those would be infected individuals who were detected through testing and then subsequently isolated, or they could be in quarantine at the time of infectiousness. So that would be like someone who was previously contact traced um, by an infected individual and then put into quarantine. And then while they were in quarantine, they, they themselves became infectious. So those would be infections among quarantined contacts of identified cases. And then finally, the final compartment is just infections in the community. So these would be undetected um, infections. So each of those, basically you could calculate the proportion of infections that fall into each of these compartments at time T. 
So for example, here I'm saying that 20% of, of infected individuals are detected um, but through testing. 10% of them are already in quarantine at time of infectiousness, and 70% of them uh, go undetected, so just are out in the community. So again, this reproductive number, we can, um, th this average number of onward transmissions that an individual is expected to make, you could have a reproductive number for each of these compartments. For example, people who are detected, uh, maybe they will um, still transmit to two people. And so the implication here is that they're transmitting uh, to folks prior to being detected. So before they test positive, they might infect two individuals on average. People in quarantine may only infect one individual on average, and so this would mean that they were discovered to be infectious once they were in quarantine. Maybe they had a little bit of infectious time prior to getting into quarantine, um, but less time than someone who was only detected via testing. And then finally, people in the community who are going totally undetected, um, their average reproductive number would be something like 2.5. So this would be like they on average are infecting two and a half people. So we have this image here um, in the in our in our paper that sort of helps to uh, explain why those reproductive numbers would be different depending on when you're infected um, or when you're detected rather, which compartment you fall into. So, for example, here at Generation T, uh, an individual might be infected. These these um, distributions here show their infectiousness. Uh, so um, the, the probability of infecting someone else. And so maybe their symptoms are onset here and they're tested at this point in time and then they're isolated in this point in time. So all this red portion of this, um, of this distribution is time when they might be infecting people or they have some probabilistic um, they have some probability of infecting people, but this green time on the on on the right side of the of when they were isolated would be reductions in transmission due to case isolation. And so that's why in that previous slide, the R that I showed for people in the detected compartment was two compared to those in the undetected compartment at two point five, because basically you're reducing some of that transmission time here in the green. And then time t plus one, this next um, little graph on the bottom, this is showing uh, for the quarantined individuals, so people in that Q or that middle compartment that I had shown. And so those would be infected contacts. And so they might get, they, because, you know, you found out that this person was sick at this time period, and they gave the, their contact tracer all of the potential contacts to identify, they may have been put into isolation before they even got their positive test result back, because they were actually quarantined at that point. Um, and so the time that was reduced in transmission was even greater for them. And so that's why uh, that our Q or the R value for those in the Q um, or quarantine compartment was just one because it was reduced by basically removing all this green part because they weren't able to infect anybody else since they were put into isolation at the right time. Okay, so the way that we get these reproductive numbers through this, uh, that the mathematical model here is that we essentially um, put, the, we have these gammas, which are like the reduction um, in, in infectious time uh, that we multiply the R for the community, which is basically the overall average of reproductive number for a given pathogen. So we take that RC, that this gamma comes from basically integrating um, from time, from symptom onset to isolation. And this here, this is just the infectiousness distribution. And similarly, this is gonna be the time from symptom onset to, uh, of a case to quarantine of the contacts. And then again, we're integrating it over the infectiousness distribution. So that's how we get those reduced reproductive numbers. Okay, so just briefly then, so we take these re reproductive numbers and we put them in this infectious matrix, this infection matrix, which basically each row corresponds to each of those compartments and those uh, R values go on the diagonals. And then we multiply to figure out the new infections at time T, we multiply the proportions in each compartment by this infectious matrix. So we have 20% in detect, 10 in quarantine, 70% um, in the community at time. Uh, at, so then the new infections that resulted from time T would be um, those proportions multiplied by those R values. So I think 
hopefully intuitively this kind of makes sense. You have 20% of folks are in this detect and they're each in infecting two people on average. Then you end up sort of seeing how many infections resulted from that. And then um, those, those folks who are uh, then infected end up getting detected or not. And so we end up um, with this matrix that on the rows we have who they were infected by. So someone who was detected, someone in quarantine or someone in the community. And then in the columns, those are dictated by where they themselves end up. So did they get detected? Did they end up in quarantine? Did they end up back in the community? So this like, for example, would be someone who was infected by someone who had been detected and then they themselves get detected. So all of these uh, quadrants here just end up getting determined by um, probabilities that you can input as the kind of knowledgeable person about whatever pathogen you're interested in. So the way this works, basically this omega here is the probability that a contact of a detected individual in the detect department is traced um, and quarantined. And uh, so you could, for example, say that that was maybe 50%. And then so omega Q is gonna be the probability of a contact of a detected individual in the quarantine compartment is traced and quarantined. So for example, I could say maybe that was a 30% probability and then these rows are going to be the probability that a community infection is detected and isolated. So maybe we're detecting 20% of our um, of our folks out in the community. Okay, so we've got this detection matrix. And basically the way that you get to the proportion of infections at time t plus one is you just multiply all these pieces together. So the proportions at time t times the infection. So that tells us how many people are infected. And then to figure out what proportions um, end up in each of those different detection boxes, we end up uh, multiplying by that detect matrix. And then we normalize it by dividing by the sum of this DQC um, matrix. Okay, so using all of those, for example, I started with 20%, 10%, 70%. And after going from time T to time T plus one, I ended up with 18% detected, 12% in quarantine and 70% in the community. And then we're gonna multiply all of those by those effective reproductive numbers. And we end up with an overall average um, reproductive number of 2.23. Now the different values that we input for, for these matter. So for example, before I was saying that we were detecting 20% of cases and 80% were remaining in the community. Let's say we're doing better. Let's say we're detecting 50% of cases. So I'm gonna replace all of those with these 0.5s here. And so if I run that through the same calculation, now I end up with different uh, proportions. And um, you know, obviously I'm gonna have a, a much more in the detect. So now 44% of people are getting detected and 44 ending up in the community. And now my effective R is lower. So now it's 2.1 and we want lower, that's the goal. So basically what I'm trying to show is that we've come up with this way to be able to sort of see how these different, um, the, these programs are able to detect um, or are, are able to, how, how effective they are at reducing transmission. So the big picture here is that the application that we're building is gonna allow public health departments to tweak these different parameters in a way that they think is practical. So if they think that they could maybe ramp up testing such that they could detect 50% of the cases in their community, they could see how that would impact onward transmission based on the other assumptions. So we have this R package that can be found on GitHub and CRAN called TTI um, that will allow you to do these calculations. But we also have a Shiny application for this as well. So you can find this Shiny application uh, at, um, you can find the code at github.com slash Hopkins IDD slash Contessa. And this is what it looks like when you go to the site. So essentially um, it starts by just explaining a little bit about what it is. And then we've got these different panels where you can input um, the, the assumptions that go into those calculations that I had talked about. So for example, you could input information about surveillance and isolation, like how much testing you're doing and how quickly you're getting people into isolation. And then once you've put in all of these, there's an interactive dashboard that lets you sort of see what those reductions in R would be. And we also have the ability to generate like a PDF report as well as save your inputs and so you can upload them later. So I'm just gonna quickly show how to do some of these things in Shiny in case that's of interest to anybody in the audience. 
Okay, so this is kind of the big picture. If you've done Shiny before, this is going to feel a little bit um, of a beginner's kind of uh, intro. But essentially here, um, the, the UI or the user interface for this particular application is done using Shiny dashboard. So we wrap um, the, the UI in this dashboard page function. So that's kind of what generates the user interface or what you see. And so this dashboard header function is what basically what we put in certain inputs to update this header at the top. So we've got like our logo and the colors and things like that are all updated from that. The dashboard sidebar here dictates what this looks like on the, on the left side. And then finally, the dashboard body is where the main, uh, the, the, the code for kind of the main part of the application goes. And then in the servers where we put all of that behind the scenes um, code, we run the TTI package, for example, to actually calculate these quantities after the user has input all of their information. And then finally, that shiny app function is what actually runs the app. So the first argument is the UI and the second argument is the server. Okay, so this next part, and I'm going through this a little bit quickly, but hopefully you'll be able to at least get a little glimpse of the types of things that you could do with an application like this and then be able to dig through our code on GitHub if it's of more use to you. But the other thing I thought was a little bit unique about this particular package is we had the ability to generate a report from the outputs. And this was because the stakeholders were often interested in a PDF or Word document that they could then hand off to their supervisors that could show, you know, if we were able to ramp up testing by 30%, then we think we would be able to reduce transmission by, you know, 20 percent or something like that. So these reports were really important as opposed to having only this kind of interactive web interface. They wanted to also have a static version. So to do that, we used RMD files, uh, R markdown files, where basically in the YAML or the part at the top of your file, you can add these parameters. And so for example, you could have a parameter called A and B. Um, and the way that we did it, I'm sure there are other ways, but the way that we did it is we just initialized these parameters by having them be missing values. Um, and then you can do things with these parameters in the reports themselves. And this is nice. This, this uh, method is nice because you can actually pass shiny input um, variables to these parameters when you're, when you're allowing that file download to happen. So I'm going to just show you quickly how you can do that. So this is a download handler, which basically gets output into this. And this code would all go in the server side of, um, of, your, shiny, of your shiny coding. And so uh, the part that I think is of interest here is in the content, which allows you to update the file. And so the first part is I create this temporary file called report.rmd. And then you have to actually copy this file. It's kind of like a weird process, but then you, so then you copy this file. Um, overwrite is true because sometimes people will create, do this more than one time. And then this is the part where I think this method kind of shines in particular with Shiny is that you can pass parameters to this particular file. And so the way you do that is just by creating a list of those parameters. And these, um, the names of the list need to match the names of the parameters that you've uh, put in the YAML or the top of your, um, of your RMD file. And then down here, you can just do a normal R markdown render uh, function where you specify that temporary file, um, you, you have the output file be the one that, is, that the user is going to download, and then you can pass the actual parameters into that in, via this params function. And then on the UI or user interface side, it's quite simple. And I, I had mine in the sidebar, so this code went in the dashboard sidebar portion of the dashboard page. And I just had this download button where they could click that button and it would generate a report. And notice that this report here keyword is the same one from the previous slide where I was this output report. Those were identical and that's what let Shiny know that this is what, what I would like to do when they click this button. All right, the last part is just the saving and loading inputs. And this was because sometimes people wanted to be able to save their work later. So they went through and put in, you know, 20 or 30 little inputs, and then they wanted to be able to reload this page um, and maybe kind of load those same inputs. And so to do this, this was again with another download handler. Uh, and what we did here is we um, input this, we allowed them to input a file name here, and we called this file the name of their file .yaml. So this was a YAML file. And then the inputs were going to be all of the uh, values for, from the Shiny that were input into the Shiny um, 
input via sh the shiny da dashboard itself. So this input is like the name of the kind of object in shiny that saves everything that the user's putting in. So this reactive values to list will take all of those reactive values, stick them in a list, and then we can make that list into a YAML file. And then we could output that so that when the user came back, they could load that YAML. Great, so I think I have like maybe two minutes. I'm not sure. Um, in case I have, I'll just show you what this link, I'm not sure I'll actually have time to really demo this much, but um, essentially there's also a Coursera class that's free if you're interested in this type of methodology that we created. Um, that, that uses this application. So it goes into more of the details about the math behind it, as well as kind of how you could use this to evaluate your contact tracing program if you happened to have one. And you can find the app here. So um, IDD Dynamics, jhu.shinyapps.io slash Contessa uh, v2. And so this v2 is, we've updated a couple of things like allowing um, for vaccine information and a couple other population level estimates that people might want to um, update in, a, in an advanced section of the application. All right, so that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You can find me on Twitter at Lucy Stats. Thank you so much. We see um, questions. I don't see any quite yet at, in the chat. So I just had a brief question in terms of, have you tried to implement this now with the monkeypox at all? And have you, have you been utilizing it in that space as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So I haven't, I was brought onto this particular project as a contractor. So I am not actually on the infectious disease dynamics team as like a, on, at a, on a regular basis. So I'm not sure it's very possible that this team at, at Hopkins is working. I'm sure that they're working on something monkeypox related. I'm not sure if they're doing this exact process, but um, I think, you know, you certainly could use the same methodology. It's, it's agnostic to the pathogen. So I'm sure you could use the same tools to be able to see how effective contact tracing is. That's, that's a harder problem because um, the incubation period is much longer. So there's it can be harder to um, trace people quickly, but yeah.